Good evening, everyone. Time for another Bitcoin report. Well, uh, the last time we had a flash crash in Bitcoins, I captured it live, so don't have the type of feed that I had that time, but uh, we've got a couple of feeds up here. We've got uh, BitcoinCharts.com, and you can see here we've got 10 day, 5 minutes, and uh, or we can just do 1 day, 1 minutes, but uh, a lot of the data is uh, it's not coming in very reliably so probably Mt. Gox is overwhelmed you can see we hit nearly 50 we actually hit 49 and uh, we're in a dramatic free fall now looks like we're touching about 38 if we go over to uh, Clark Moody again the data is not coming in very well and that's probably because of overwhelming volume. So is this another Bitcoin flash crash? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, interesting timing uh, that uh, at the moment uh, that we have this, we have the release of Chris Duane's um, Bitcoin Ponzi scheme. I want to examine that. Now, if you recall, if you follow my Silver, Silver channel, I had a debate with Chris Duane about that. And, and we disagreed about Bitcoin uh, and we'll we'll see who ends up being right let's watch a little bit of uh, the intro to his uh, Bitcoin this is called Bitcoin bubble warning and then there's a 15 minute Bitcoin Ponzi scheme and uh, we'll start off with the Bitcoin bubble warning Today I'm going to be releasing a half hour two part documentary on Bitcoin and why it's a Ponzi scheme and its possible connections to the CIA. So before I release this video, I just want to let people know that the last time I addressed Bitcoin was on June 7th, 2011, when I wrote this article called What Will Collapse First, Bitcoin or the Dollar? And 12 days later, it collapsed to zero. So now that I'm going to be releasing it again, and that Bitcoin's actually gone up from $30 to $48 in a few days, I highly suggest that people exchange these Bitcoins for silver. So now let me correct that misnomer. First of all, uh, Bitcoins did not collapse to zero. Uh, one exchange was hacked, that was Mt. Gox, and uh, all of those prices were revised. Now ultimately Bitcoin did fall from there to a low of two. Uh, as I covered in the video, actually showing it go to a penny you can go on my channel and uh, find that live coverage of it going to a penny but of course those weren't real trades it was hacked and uh, those were uh, reversed now uh, there were other exchanges that existed and the price did not fall on those so that's not completely accurate we'll continue I have no interest in this site in fact I just found it about two minutes ago it's called coinable.com and I'm going to post the link here and I highly suggest that you get out of Bitcoin today and turn it into something real before it collapses again. You are watching a crash in real time. So are... that's the coverage of my video and uh, I'll do a detailed analysis of this two-part series that Chris does on Bitcoin being a Ponzi scheme. But uh, I just wanted to examine first the definition and, and we'll look at that. But let's uh, get back to the prices. You can see we're pushing 38 now with uh, Clark Moody, which is getting a live feed from Mt. Gox, but uh, you can't really rely on it when it's coming in. Uh, you can see we're still very, very wide, or we're not as wide as we are, were. You can see we're at the ask of 38.3 and a bit of 38 and we go down to the 37 so uh, it's not quite as wide as it was uh, maybe there's some bottoming but uh, if we pull out to the 15 minute you can see that we've pretty much taken out the bulk of this run-up now this run-up was very quick uh, it broke out from 32 or so and ran all the way up near to 50 and now we're back down to 38 so 
while we let the market trade and sort itself out and by the way I am all in cash right now in my Mt. Gox account I haven't uh, come back in yet um, I'm trying to pick a point again it's still kind of a play money account I don't have a lot of money there I'm just playing but uh, I may uh, watch it when we get to, if we get back to 34 uh, next support is going to be around 32 going to be watching very closely what the price does at those price points but uh, let's go over to Wikipedia and take a look at the definition of a Ponzi scheme and then we're going to think a little bit about Bitcoin and whether or not it is a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme is a fraudulent investment operation now that's going to be key remember that it's an investment operation that pays returns to its investors from their own money or the money paid by subsequent investors. So first off we have to recognize that a Ponzi scheme is at least it is marketed as an investment. In other words if we go and look at investment and investment is uh, putting money into something with an expectation of a gain usually over a longer term but uh, usually a good investment is going to be an investment in a business or some type of uh, capital investment that returns uh, income based upon the success of that business so you're looking for a return of your capital uh, earnings on your capital so the question is the first question to ask is was Bitcoin marketed as an investment in other words uh, was it marketed to uh, by early adopters to uh, the later adopters as an investment and I'm going to argue that no it wasn't that is not how it was marketed it was actually marketed as an alternative currency there was no promise of return in fact uh, there was no return at all there's just a potential appreciation very similar to gold and silver in that regard so I would say based on that uh, definition it does not meet the uh, definition of a Ponzi scheme because there is no investment and there are no investors rather than from profit earned by the individual or organization running the operation the Ponzi scheme usually entices new investors by offering higher returns than other investments now uh, I know there may have been people who made projections about the price of Bitcoin but when I got into it which was roughly June of 2000 May of 2011 uh, I did not get into it because I expected uh, a return on my investment I actually got into it because I was uh, betting that it was actually going to be a successful alternative currency uh, and whether or not it would appreciate I wasn't really too concerned about that I was more concerned about uh, having some and beginning to trade them and use them in the form of short-term returns that are either abnormally high or unusually consistent again uh, Bitcoin does not meet those and did not offer those. Perpetuation of the high returns requires an ever-increasing flow of money from new investors to keep the scheme going. Now that is true in the sense that this price of Bitcoin is rising because there are new investors coming in but because Bitcoin doesn't actually promise any returns to anyone it's not necessary that there be a continuing uh, flow of funds in there because there's really nothing to maintain it stands on its own again you could liken it to gold gold doesn't promise a return uh, gold is just simply gold so it goes on to explain the system is designed to collapse because of the earnings if any are less than the payments to investors so again with Bitcoin there are no earnings there are no payments and there are no investors 
Usually the scheme is interrupted by legal authorities before it collapses because a Ponzi scheme is suspected or because the promoter is selling unregistered securities. And of course that comes under securities law. Bitcoin is nothing like a security. As more investors become involved, the likelihood of the scheme coming to the attention of authorities increases. And uh, it's named after Charles Ponzi and it goes on. So from that definition I would have to say that uh, Bitcoin really only tan tangentially meets some of the things but really it is in no way a Ponzi scheme because it just simply doesn't meet the definition now what's interesting and we'll play a little bit of the second video that we have here from Chris on uh, this is the first video of the series but uh, we'll play a little bit of this one Every age has its particular folly, some scheme, project, or fantasy, into which it plunges, spurred on by the love of gain, the necessity of excitement, or the force of intimidation. Charles McKay, 1841 When I first started the Sons of Liberty Academy, The Greatest Truth Never Told, and The Silver Shield Report, I set about creating an intellectual foundation for a decentralized, individual-based, logical, sustainable, competitive currency, simply to be the freest and fairest society. The more I try to explore this idea, the more I have run counter to other ideologies. These followers take a great deal amount of time spamming me with comments, emails, and videos talking about how their ideology is superior to mine. So for the next few videos, I'm going to explore some of the most egregious spammers and their solutions. The first clear difference I see is that most of these other ideologies are collectives that are run by scheming men that use indoctrination and talking points to have the individual sacrifice into this collective. I would rather to empower the individual to use their logic through the trivium and to listen to all and follow none. Let me first say that I believe the solution for our current monetary disorder is competition in currency. As a libertarian, I don't care what free individuals choose to use, but once again I'm getting inundated with emails, comments, and requests for me to drink the Bitcoin Kool-Aid. This has happened to me once before in June 2011, when there was a concerted effort to recruit bloggers to support this Bitcoin idea. Now, I don't really know where Chris is getting that from. I don't know of anyone who recruited anyone to support the idea. Uh, I created a Bitcoin channel and created a Bitcoin blog later on. But uh, really, honestly, I could care less whether or not uh, someone is recruited. Uh, ultimately, the uh, success of Bitcoin is going to rise or fall based upon a whether it really is what it says it is and b whether people decide uh, that it is in fact that and uh, use their own money so I actually see it meeting more the definition of what he is looking for uh, than what he's criticizing let's go on in an obvious attempt I felt to build up the perceived value of Bitcoin while most bloggers and pundits grasped onto it and even hailed its arrival I did not in fact, the more that I looked into it and got behind the pushed out memes of peer-to-peer, -peer, anonymous, Bitcoin isn't 100% anonymous, cryptocurrency, I saw that it was just a good old-fashioned Ponzi scheme. Now I believe that I'm the only guy that really has paid attention to Bitcoin that has come out against it, and I'm good with that. I have already been proven right about Bitcoin, and it happened very quickly when I wrote an article June 7, 2011, titled, What Will Collapse First, Bitcoin or the Dollar? And only 12 days after that, the entire Bitcoin market flash crashed from a weekly high of $32 to one cent on June 19th. And now that's my video uh, covering the Mt. Gox flash crash. And uh, again, as I pointed out, uh, that's not the true price of Bitcoin. It, it didn't go to zero. Uh, that was just one exchange, the primary exchange that was hacked. Here we go, we lost the Mt. Gox feed again. We still have not seen one buy. We're down to 12 cents, 11 cents, 10 cents. Wow, this is it. Feed gone again. We're down to 10 cents. We're down to 9 cents, 6 cents. We are going 5 cents. We are down to, wow. I don't know what this means, people. We are down to 1 cent. 
There's still no buying. And perhaps one of the most epic crashes I've ever seen in any market in terms of just straight down to nothing. So now that Bitcoin is back above $32 range again, after gaining 200... So if Bitcoin is back above $32 again, and it was down to a penny, then isn't it true that the dollar crashed first? Because uh, if you look at a dollar chart, an inverse dollar chart in Bitcoins, then you would have to say that the dollar in fact did crash before Bitcoins. ...percent in the past two months and 600% in the past six months. Let's see if a little dose of logic once again brings a little reality to the Bitcoin hype. Paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value, zero. Voltaire, 1729. For those of you that don't... And the reason why that principle is true is because paper money has a central authority that can print unlimited amounts of it. But whether or not you agree with the principle that Bitcoin is limited, then you may challenge that. You may think that it's corrupt or there's a back door. Uh, at least taking it on its face, uh, Bitcoin does not meet that because there is no central authority that can print unlimited amounts. No, the idea of Bitcoin is that it's a $400 million cryptocurrency that can be traded peer-to-peer -peer without any outside government interference. These digital coins are traded and stored on your computer. Bitcoin started in 2009 when people quote-unquote mined these Bitcoins on their computer by downloading the software program that allowed your computer to run for days on an algorithm to quote unquote create these bitcoins. This program was designed to make the coins rare and therefore have some value. There will only be 21 million bitcoins ever in existence. In May of 2011, before any of the public got involved, there were already 6 million bitcoins mined by the early adopters in just over a year. Now there are 10.8 million bitcoins. Through this algorithm, the more coins that are in existence, the harder it will be to quote mine these coins. Now the question is, what backs bitcoin? People have to wonder. Well, again, and this was the subject of our debate, uh, nothing backs Bitcoin. Bitcoin is backed by its properties as money, and that attracts uh, value. Uh, one could ask what backs gold, and of course the answer is, again, its properties, and that attracts uh, interest in its value. Well, where where did the initial uh, dollars come from? How many bitcoins are out there? And do those bitcoins have any, in the way silver certificates were backed? You know, originally dollars were backed by silver in the United States. Right. Uh, are, is there some silver in a bank account somewhere, or can, who's making the bitcoins and selling them in the first place? When you understand that paper money used to be a receipt of real valued goods like gold or silver and that through the deceit of the bankers and the politicians they've systematically removed any physical backing to the point that we have a world inundated with unbacked fiat currency. It is easy to see how Bitcoin can take the next leap. Where the dollar is merely ghost of money, Bitcoin's actually an illusion of a ghost of money. It is not even really money, it is more a cryptocurrency that might have some redeeming qualities about moving value, but I would stay away from owning or buying any Bitcoins as a store value or even a risky asset. The only thing that gives bitcoins its value is its perception. Well, the only thing that gives gold value is its perception. If people are willing to work for bitcoins and they think that they are rare, they will have some value. Just like those World of Warcraft gold coins that you hear about. The more that is accepted and the more that people are aware of it, the more that they will be worth. That's just simple economics. One of the early adopters that cashed in on this bitcoin idea is Gavin Anderson. He made the case that Bitcoins are sort of like gold because they are rare and therefore have some value. Bitcoins serve the three main functions of money, medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value. To be honest, anything can serve as currency, so it's not really that big of a deal. The real factor is if this has any intrinsic value. And I constantly rail against the dollar for becoming worthless, but the sad fact is the dollar is worth much more than Bitcoin will ever be. While some people may work for bitcoins, you cannot pay for your taxes, your house, your mortgage, your car payments, your food, your medical payments, or anything else really with bitcoins. Plus the dollar has the power of the government behind it which is accepted worldwide. The problem for the dollar is that it's reaching its climax and there are way too many excesses that are built into the system and it will ultimately collapse in the single largest event in human history. In order for you to mine these bitcoins, you would need to download the software 
and have a computer run full blast for 10 years to generate any Bitcoins at all. I have the software loaded and I went to my settings yep. and I said generate coins. Um, yeah, that's a really bad idea. Oh, is it? So I don't know why he's uh, getting this really inexperienced guy who doesn't know anything about Bitcoins. This is really dated material, so let's skip this. Coins. But not in the mining itself, since the equipment and the electricity to run it costs real money. And you'll probably spend far more money on the electricity than the value of the Bitcoins that it produces. The added joy of this program is that the more people that try to mine Bitcoins, the harder it is to mine them. Right off the bat, the average owner of a laptop or a home PC will never mine any Bitcoins. And I believe that this was done more as a psych experiment. If the average person thinks that these coins will have value, and because they cannot make them easily, it will only encourage them to go buy them. Uh, Bitcoin was first launched in January of 2009, um, which is actually before I heard about it. So it was kind of launched very quietly um, and then tested for, uh, bounced along for more than a year. Uh, and it wasn't until about a, a year and a half after it first started that it really started to gain some traction and people really started to, to use it um, and the bitcoins actually started to have some value before then bitcoins were, were worthless. No one can argue that the early adopters are getting something for nothing and that they already had six million bitcoins produced before they went public. Assuming that those that started this scheme generated the coins relatively easily with easy algorithms and powerful computers working non-stop to generate these coins at essentially no cost, they were worth nothing to begin with. So the argument that they were getting something for nothing, I don't think that argument is valid. They did have something. They had to mine those coins. They had to run the hashes. They had to generate the coins. Uh, they only get something if others perceive value in them and uh, they go up in value. So uh, there's a lot of things like that that you can invest in that uh, you buy it and others uh, value it and then you can sell it for more. So uh, you could say that about just about any commodity or anything that becomes popular. Which makes you wonder why somebody would be doing this. The only people that will be making money off of this are the insiders to the scheme with highly specialized computers that can run crazy algorithms and generate them much faster than the average Joe. Well, that's not true either because there are plenty of people who will be making money off them if they end up using them for transactions. Uh, I think the figure that I saw today was that uh, someone sent $10,000 uh, and the transaction cost was $0.08. Cents. So if that's the case, that people are actually transacting and uh, exchanging goods and services for that, then uh, there is value there because if you compare it to the amount of money that the banksters take out of those transactions, uh, that value is there. And I'm not even so sure that these algorithms would actually do this and why they couldn't just created this out of thin air and then after the fact make it very difficult to ever get them. And to the point where we are now, who's going to spend years crunching an algorithm? The first thing I thought of when I heard this Bitcoin scheme was the carbon credit scheme that the elite were trying to push. Through government regulation, they would force companies to buy carbon credits to offset the pollution that they were producing. The scam was that there would only be a limited number of credits and a forced rise regulated demand. These companies would be carbon neutral by investing in green technologies. Of course, these credits and technologies were owned by a group of insiders who thought of the whole scheme and then set about creating the demand through a huge propaganda campaign, most notably pushed by Al Gore. When the lie was exposed in the Climate Gate scandal, the carbon credit market collapsed to its intrinsic value, zero. Yes, the carbon credit uh, market collapsed because the carbon credit market was a centrally controlled market and it wasn't based upon investor confidence and people actually valuing it. It was imposed, so I would think that would be uh, a reason why Chris would favor Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin doesn't have the force of government to push this scheme. So it comes into the marketing and building up the perception of. A year and a half after it first started that it really started to gain some traction and people really started to, to use it um, and the Bitcoins actually started to have some value before then Bitcoins were, were worthless. The first Bitcoin was worthless because no one knew what they were or accepted them as payment. Now that people are hearing about this and are sold on this dream, they're now being bought and sold for dollars. 
So given that fact that this was quote unquote so difficult to create bitcoins now, and presumably that there's a limited number of them, this would naturally lead to speculation. So these guys that started and have these 6 million bitcoins created from thin air now have close to $210 million in bitcoins. I mean, that's like the equivalent of 230 tons of silver created from some hashtag algorithm. Does that make any sense? So who created Bitcoin? Well, that's a mystery too, to a certain extent. It is said that this programmer, Satoshi Nakamoto, released the source code and no one really knows who he is or even if he exists. Talk about uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. So we'll stop it here and continue on later, but I wanted to bring up that issue of Satoshi Nakamoto and in regards to a Ponzi scheme. So we know that Ponzi schemes, whether it was Bernie Madoff or Charles Ponzi, ultimately they collapse and it usually has to do with the investment, uh, the intervention of the legal authorities and uh, they're arrested. You can see the mugshot of uh, Charles Ponzi. We know that uh, Bernie Madoff is uh, rotting away in prison but uh, as uh, Chris points out Satoshi Nakamoto has disappeared so what type of a Ponzi scheme do you have where the person who created it has disappeared is no longer collecting any money and uh, is can't be found so again there's another example of how Bitcoin doesn't match a traditional Ponzi scheme in any sense of the word. So let's get back to the Bitcoin charts. Uh, this is from BitcoinCharts.com and uh, we'll refresh that. Again, uh, the Gox feed information is going very slow. Uh, it's not like the last time we saw it. You can see now we're down at 34 and uh, we'll refresh uh, the Clark Moody uh, that data seems to be running late as well. So it looks like we may be getting down near a 34 price. Uh, we'll check one more time on the bid ask. We've got 34.1 on the bid, 35.2 on the ask. So we've got a full Bitcoin uh, spread between bid and ask, which is unusually wide. So we're still following, still falling, and uh, seem to be falling on fairly large volume. You can see uh, the volume is about 2,500, and uh, most of them are red bars. So let's go out, take one more look. You can see we have uh, a spike and a drop, very similar to the one we had in the original uh, Bitcoin crash, uh, very similar this candlestick is actually even more significant so uh, we are going to watch this very closely uh, do I think that uh, Mt. Gox was hacked this time no I don't think that Mt. Gox was hacked this time I'm going to watch very closely the support ultimately I think is going to come in at the last top probably between 30 and 32 and we'll see if that support holds and we'll talk to you next time